Good morning, everybody. How's it going? All right, looks like just about everybody's muted. Um, but feel free to, to chat over there on the side or um, unmute yourself and ask a question, you know, or let me know how life is and all that good stuff. So let's see here. Uh, does class start at 8.30, 8.35? Do you guys remember? 8.25. Oh, 8, okay. Um, and Zoom only lets us start like in 30 minute in 30 minute intervals, which is weird. It's also weird that like APU, you know, just doesn't have like all their classes start like at eight or 8.30 or nine. Like it's always this 25 and strange, strange things. But anyway, that's, that's the joys of scheduling, I guess. So anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, I've gotten a couple questions about the exam coming up. So let me um, uh, kind of zoom out a little bit. In fact, I might even pull up the uh, course syllabus with you just to kind of walk you through where we are. Where'd it go? Let me pull it up and then I'll share my screen with you in a second. Okay, you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Great. So let me scroll on down to where we're at. So remember um, with the uh, provost and president email kind of pushing cla um, um, canceling classes for that week while students kind of moved off campus? What we did to kind of make up that time with these kind of, oops, where'd it go? With uh, classes being um, canceled on 319 what we did is kind of push things back so last week we covered group influence today we're going to cover prejudice which is normally on our previous syllabi when we were going to have exam four but what i've done today is we'll just cover prejudice in class and then uh, your exam four is due in two weeks so uh, no class next week because of spring break so then before we meet again on the 16th that's when your exam four is due and it's the same format as every other exam, you know, closed book, closed notes. Um, uh, I did set a, a time limit on it that is comparable to the same amount of time that we have in class. So if class goes from like 8.30 to 11, I put a two and a half hour time limit on it. So um, feel free anytime over the next two weeks to knock out exam four before we meet again on the 16th. Any, any questions about that? Wait, we aren't meeting until the 16th? Yeah, because next week is uh, oh, Easter, break. Okay. Easter break. I see this. Yep. Okay, got it. And then after that, we have two more chapters, attraction, intimacy, aggression, and then the final exam is on uh, the 30th at a little bit different time, 7.30 to 9.20. So uh, for exam five, I'll make the exam open during that time, just so your, none of your other final exams conflict with one another. And then that's it. The semester's really flown by in like out of two halves. You know, I feel like the first half really flew by and then it was this crazy transition online and now it feels like the semester's almost over. Prejudice, no class next week, and then attraction, and then aggression, and that's it. So if you have uh, any questions about that, just let me know. Um, and when you're taking exam four, if you know anything, anything uh, quirky, just let me know. Um, I got a lot of emails saying that there was like the peak answer listed, listed twice 
So I went in there and, and uh, changed that. So made sure that everyone got credit for listing peak. It didn't matter which one you, which one you listed. So anyway, thanks for, thanks for that. And after the 16th, when you guys finish exam four, I'll go through with like a fine tooth comb and look at all of the item analytics and just really make sure that um, there aren't any poor questions or no questions were miskeyed or, you know, anything, anything weird, weird going on. Cool. Um, last night, I also sent um, uh, an announcement saying if you're uh, wanting to watch the Stanford Prison Experiment on Netflix, it's a cool movie that kind of goes through the experience of the participants and the prisoners and prison guards. Anyway, if you want to watch that, send me an email. Let me know what you think of the movie, how it relates to social psych, and um, I'll throw some extra credit your way. Sound good? Cool. All right, I'm getting a lot of like 8 a.m. head nods. <laughs> I like that. So let's let's uh, dive into our prejudice chapter for today. Sound good? Good. All right, so all of these slides should be available to you. Um, I just saw a question came in from Elise saying, when should the extra credit be turned in by? Um, the final deadline for, for any extra credit um, would be the day of the final exam. So you have the entire semester. After your final exam scores come in, then I'll go back through, run the item analytics, correct any items that need to be corrected, and then finalize your grades from there. So if the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the final exam is on the 30th. So by April 30th. Good question. <coughs> Sorry. I'm sure that was like right into the speaker. <laughs> All right. When you, you guys see this page, do you see like the group chat on the side or your pictures on the side? You do? Okay. All right, if that makes you a little self-conscious, I'll put it down there for you. Oops, anyway, I guess it's not gonna let me. There we go. So let's, let's start off talking about prejudice, which is a really, uh, uh, <laughs> a really depressing topic to, to, uh, to talk about, but has so, it's so incredibly important to understand why people hate, right? Why people dislike other people based on superficial characteristics like the color of their skin or their weight or their gender or their beliefs and values, things like that. Um, so let me, let me dive in and I will um, do my best, try not to get too kind of fired up about this because of all the areas of social psychology, the prejudice chapter this week and the attraction chapter in two weeks are my favorite. It's my research area of why people love and why people hate and the impact that that has on people's lives. So before I dive in, let me hit you guys with a few definitions for your notes. Um, what is stereotyping? What is prejudice? And what is discrimination? And I want to make a point of this because people use these terms interchangeably and technically they're different. So whenever you hear the term stereotype, think of this as that kind of belief about this group. It is your making inferences about someone based on his or her group membership. So stereotypes can be positive, right? That Asians are good at math or they can be negative, that Asians are bad drivers, for instance, to pick on, on the single group that has both positive and negative stereotypes. Um, there are positive negative stereotypes about the elderly, for instance, right? That they have bad memories, but they are wise and caring and nurturing and things like that. Um, so if you were to meet someone and just see, hey, they have really wrinkly skin, they look like they're old, what you could do is if you were stereotyping is make inferences about that person. I, I assume that they have a bad memory because of their group membership being old. Um, and we'll talk about today of why stereotypes are so resistant to change and 
what conditions they can change, are stereotyping inevitable, are stereotypes accurate? Um, there are stereotypes, there are some stereotypes that are accurate, there are some stereotypes that are completely false, and there are some stereotypes that are based on kind of a kernel of truth that's been exaggerated over time. And when you kind of take a step back and just think about like, what is a stereotype? Like you're trying to judge an individual by your assumption of an entire group, just given the kind of variability, right? Just given the bell curve on like what normal variability within any group looks like. When you make a snapshot judgment and just start applying like, well, the mean or you must be average, you must fit this group, you're automatically going to lose information about the individual. So anyway, sorry, I'm going on a, a tangent already. But in short, stereotypes are these beliefs. So in making inferences about a person's character based on his or her group membership. Prejudice is a feeling, right? It's that judgment that you have about someone. Um, and most of the time when people are using the term prejudice, they're referring to like a negative feeling. Like I dislike someone because of his or her group membership. It's possible to have like a positive prejudice as well, like kind of prejudging, like liking someone based on his or her group membership before you really get a chance to meet them. But I mean, 99% of the time when people are using the term prejudice, they're referring to it in a negative way. So it's negative judgment, like disliking someone because of his or her group membership. So stereotypes are beliefs, these kind of inferences about their character. Prejudice is your own kind of feeling, your negative judgment towards someone because of his or her group membership. And then discrimination is as soon as you act on it. As soon as you start changing the way you treat this person, you start behaving differently because of his or her group membership, that's discrimination. It could be um, uh, real blatant or subtle discrimination. It could be things like, I'm not going to hire this person for a job because of his or her group membership. That would be discrimination. Or it could be a subtle thing like, I'm not going to sit very close to this person or I'm not gonna reach out to shake this person's hand, or I'm not gonna smile as often during this conversation. You know, so like kind of an implicit or automatic behavior that stems from people's negative stereotypes, their prejudice, and their discrimination. Any, any questions about those terms? What was that? I'm sorry, I'm not quite picking you up all that well. What you, what you can do is write it over in the group chat over here. If you have a question about those three. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Would you say that like the ultimate, well, I guess, like, would you say that they ha like they usually lead to the next thing? Yeah, they tend to be related to each other. So once people start stereotyping someone, so making the assumption, for instance, of like, oh, you go to Biola or something like that, right? You have, you have this kind of like negative stereotype about someone, you know, making, making inferences about their but their faith or how judgy they are or something like that, right? As soon as you have that stereotype, it tends to lead to negative prejudices. And once you start having these negative prejudices, then that tends to lead towards discrimination. So there is a strong correlation between these three. So like the people that endorse the most negative stereotypes also tend to be the most prejudiced. And the people that are the most prejudiced, right? Like the alt-right marching down the streets of Charlottesville, chanting Jews will not replace us. Like that hatred is leading to that kind of discriminatory behavior of choosing to run people over with their car. Like, like to use a really extreme example. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, unfortunately, stereotypes are automatically activated, which is a fancy way of saying like, we live in a society where we watch TV and we hear racist and sexist and homophobic jokes and we know that the stereotypes are out there. Um, but we can um, uh, stop, uh, we can control our prejudice. We can control the way we feel towards a certain group, even though the stereotypes are gonna be automatically activated. Um, uh, that kind of gets back to the like white bear effect. 
you guys might have heard in like a cognitive psych class along the way. I'm saying like, whatever you do right now, don't think of a white bear. It's like the only thing that you think about, right? Stereotyping is really that, that same way, that people are kind of cognitive misers and they want to use every sort of shortcut that they have along the way to, to, um, you know, to judge and predict people's behavior. And I'll talk about it in the next few slides, um, tying it in. Here we go. Stereotypes. So is stereotyping inevitable? And the answer is unfortunately yes. It's unavoidable and it's functional. So it's functional to the extent to which people are cognitive misers and they, they don't like to think unless they have to. They wanna run on autopilot and only start um, really processing information about the world around them if they need to. So, um, like, let's say that you have um, a um, stereotype about old people, right? Like how much TV they watch or like um, how good or bad drivers they are. When you meet someone for the first time and find out that they're old, you might apply these stereotypes of, oh, I assume that you must be a bad driver. Until you um, uh, meet this person and interact with this person, you realize, oh my gosh, like grandpa used to be like an NASCAR driver and like is still really like has great resources. Like, um, 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 what's the word? Um, is like the faculties are all there and their vision's still, you know, grandpa's vision's really great. and and grandpa loves driving and drives every day. Like as soon as you get this individuating information about a person, then you disregard the stereotype. But unfortunately, when you enter into that interaction and notice that this person is part of that negatively stereotyped group, you use those stereotypes until you get information about the individual and then you drop the stereotype. Um, I wish that when people encounter kind of counter stereotypic information about somebody that they would just drop the stereotype towards the whole group. But unfortunately what people do instead is they tend to kind of subtype. So like, for instance, if you hold the stereotype that, Oh my gosh, you're a psych major. That must mean that like you're really warm and people can talk to you about things. Right. Or you're a chemistry major. You must not be very like empathic or something like that. You might not be a people person. What happens is, let's say you're walking around campus and you bump into a chemistry major at APU and you find out this person is really warm and empathic and cares about people and, and is easy to talk to. Instead of saying, huh, maybe my stereotype about chemistry majors is wrong, what people tend to do is subtype and say, well, if you're a chemistry major at APU, then you are a lot more people oriented and you're easier to talk to. So unfortunately, people don't disregard these stereotypes. They use them, but they just make them a little bit more nuanced and kind of subtyped from there. Um, the next point I want to bring up uh, is are stereotypes appropriate? There are some stereotypes that are completely false and that when you use these false stereotypes, you are, um, you are losing all the appropriate nuance of who this individual is and everything that they bring to the table. You're letting all those sort of preconceptions that are being shaped by society and the media and the movies and the jokes and other people's experience color your own perception of the world, which um, can lead to all sorts of, of poor policies and lingering institutional racism and sexism and all sorts of, of downstream poor outcomes for people that have been historically stigmatized over time, which is terrible. So, um, so there are some stereotypes out there that are completely false. There are some stereotypes that are true. So there is the stereotype that women are taller than men. And if you were to look at the kind of distributions of what they look like, right, there are some men who are really, really tall over here on this kind of tail. And there's some men who are really, really short over here on this tail and some men that are about average, right? Uh, you know, like five, six or something like that. 
if you were to look at women, right, and look at the same distribution, there are some women that are really, really short. There's some women that are really, really tall, right? And there's some women that are most about average, right? They're like 5'5". Five, five. And if you were to look at the mean difference between the two, 5'5 five, five compared to 5'6", yeah, there is a difference there that the average man on average is taller than the average woman on average. So if you didn't know anything else about someone, and you're saying, hey, we need a center for our basketball team and we need the tallest person, you know, should you pick a man or a woman, right? If you have no other individual information to go on, you could, as a heuristic, use the stereotype that on average, women are taller than men. Um, and more often than not, kind of get the answer right. But the problem with that stereotype is you lose all that within group variability you lose all that sort of appropriate nuance of there's a huge difference between really short guys and really tall guys. And there's a huge difference between really short women and really tall women. So even though the difference between the groups is there and it's statistically significant, is it meaningfully significant? Well, not really, right? There's so much more with the in-group variability than there is between group variability. And it pisses me off, to be frank. To read books like Men Are From Venus and, or what's it, Men Are From Venus, Women Are From Mars, or something like that. It's like, no, we aren't on two different planets, right? Instead, when you actually look at the data, you find that the effect sizes for how different these two groups are are actually really, really small. In fact, there's a whole lot more overlap between men, men and women. Um, the uh, uh, same thing popped up um, with gender differences in like visual spatial intelligence so like seeing those sort of cubes that are turned weird ways are there gender differences in in um, the ability of men and women to like mentally rotate that cube and see where it fit on a building or fit in a lego box or something like that yeah on average men tend to score slightly higher than women but again the variability is so huge that some women are great at the stats, some are, some are really bad, some men are really bad at the stats, some men are really great. But if you look at the differences between the distributions, there is a difference, but it's really, really small. And unfortunately, you have all sorts of stereotypes that get played out of um, and perpetuated generation after generation where you have little boys being encouraged to kind of play with Legos and little girls to play with dolls instead. And that leads to more kind of systematic problems down the line when you enroll in an engineering class in college and you only see, you know, either zero women in that class or just one or two. And that's a problem, right? It's a problem for, for the sake of like diversity and inclusiveness in those situations. In fact, you have people like um, foreclosing on careers that they would otherwise be incredibly good at, right? For those women who are really high in visual spatial intelligence, right? The top of that curve should probably be in that engineering class, right? And should be contributing in that way to designing buildings and mentally rotating objects. You could do so a lot better than a lot of the guys out there. But it, what's, what's problematic is when you kind of get to college, you face so many kind of burden, uh, uh, hurdles and obstacles along the way. This kind of pushback of saying, well, you're violating that stereotype or that's not what you know, girls major in, that's what, not what boys major in. And then to correct that, what you find is institutes of higher education implementing more, more kind of STEM programs early on to kind of combat those stereotypes and more kind of scholarships later on saying, hey, like, you know, women are underrepresented in this field, let's incentivize getting them into these classes so we can start you know, chipping away at some of those false stereotypes that people have. And unfortunately, is when you're in that class and you're the only one that looks like you, you don't feel like you belong. Um, so the um, um, more effective interventions now are not just looking at, at scholarships and STEM programs early on. They're also looking at a sense of belonging and exposure to role models that are counter stereotypic. So, sorry, that's a tangent, but like you see the same thing kind of creep up with gender differences in visual spatial intelligence, gender differences in empathy, right? You know, just look, look, at, look at our psych class, you know, like how many women are psychology majors and, you know, it fits that, that stereotype of, oh, you are good with feelings and you're good with people. Well, there are 
mean differences between men and women when it comes to empathy, but they're really, really small. In fact, there's some men who are really low on empathy and some that are really, really high and some women who are really, really low on empathy and some that are really, really high. But when you look at the variability between those two groups, it's small. Um, the within group variability between women, between men is so much greater than the small between groups variability. So, sorry, tangent about getting pissed off about men are from Venus and women are from Mars and things like that. And the same thing has been perpetuated in like the intelligence community about racial differences in intelligence. It's like when you look at these distributions, there is so much incredible overlap and there's all sorts of layers of bias and negative stereotypes that we'll talk about today, which explain why there are no gender different or no gender differences in intelligence, no racial differences in intelligence. But instead, what's happening is people's uh, stereotypes and prejudices and discrimination have been creeping in over time to make it seem like there are differences when they aren't actually there. So all of that to say, are stereotypes appropriate? It depends on whether it's accurate or not. There are a lot of stereotypes that are completely false or some stereotypes that are, I guess, kind of true, like a kernel of truth that have been vastly exaggerated over time. Any, any questions about stereotype accuracy? It's such a um, like important question, but, something, but a topic that I've heard a lot of uh, students and faculty are really afraid to kind of dive into. Um, and in my personal feeling here is that when you start understanding of why stereotypes exist, what is their function, are they accurate or not, then you really start to understand the kind of background behind them and then you can start changing people's stereotypes. And in fact, um, in 1930, Katz and Braley, a couple of researchers at Princeton, have been looking at what stereotypes people hold towards various groups, and then they run the same study every 30 years. So in 1930, 1960, 1990, and they'll be doing the same thing in 2020 this year. And they show that, thankfully, people's stereotypes do change. Um, for America, most of the stereotypes have become more positive over time, in case you're curious. Um, although some groups, especially Middle Eastern, after September 11th, weren't even included in some of the early studies in the Katz and Braley of looking at stereotypes towards this group. And then after like September 11th, where people are, again, relying on these stereotypes of, oh, well, a terrorist looks like this, start endorsing a lot more kind of negative stereotypes, which lead to negative prejudices which lead to hate crimes after September 11th of people pulling cab drivers out of their cars and beating them up just because they looked like someone who didn't look like them, who didn't look American, for instance, which is terrible. So when are stereotypes developed? Sorry, I'm hearing a lot of silence on your end. Ho ho hopefully this is coming across as, as, um, as something that's really like timely and so gosh darn important. Let me pull up your pictures here for a sec. You agree? Some head nods? Okay, good. Sorry, I, I closed down all the windows on the side so I couldn't get any of that like feedback whether you guys are like shaking your heads or, or you know, like nodding along or things like that. So uh, when do people normally acquire stereotypes? Unfortunately, they acquire them when they're kids, when they, when they are not directly relevant. And this is partly because kids aren't these little budding scientists that PJ thought that they are. They aren't you know, designing experience, experiments and like critically testing the assumptions that mom and dad are telling them. No, like kids believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all sorts of things where they're just passively accepting the information that's told to them. Right? If mom and dad say it, then it must be true. And the problem is, is what if you live in a really racist, sexist, homophobic, like you insert the prejudice. What if you live in a very prejudiced household? What if you live in a household where mom and dad are espousing these stereotypes? 
either explicitly, right, by like encouraging these jokes, watching really stereotypic TV shows and movies and things like that, or whether they're just walking down the street, for instance, and all of a sudden someone who looks different starts walking up and they squeeze their kid's hand just a little bit tighter and they pull their, their purse in just a little bit tighter. The kid, right, is making this sort of association of, huh, all of a sudden mom's a little less comfortable. Uh, all of a sudden mom looks a little bit more threatened or scared or uneasy in this situation. And they're trying to, as kids, understand the world around them. So they're picking up and looking at all these cues and they see someone, it's like, oh, this must be the reason. And they start making these classically conditioned associations that last their entire lifetime. So they can either be in subtle ways like that or a lot more explicit from hearing stories about what grandma and grandpa were, were saying of what life was like and things like that, which, which is, is really unfortunate because you start developing, kids start developing these stereotypes and they passively accept them. They aren't critical of that information and they don't know whether it's true or not. So then later on, when the stereotypes become relevant and they start interacting with people outside their household, they act on those you know, negative stereotypes and use them until they get the individuating information and then they would dismiss the stereotype or subtype it. So it looks like there's a question that just came in from Megan. It says, what would it mean if I sat down with my mom at age four to seven and asked her to confess that babies don't come from storks and Santa Claus and the Easter bunnies aren't real? So I'm, I'm, uh, don't tell your kids that Santa Claus isn't real and the Easter bunny is not real, right? There's, there's certain, certain, um, you know, joys of having kids and like, like the kind of special magicness of like Christmas morning and Santa coming and all that stuff. I'm not saying like you need to be harsh, kind of realist with your kids. But what I'm saying here is you need to be really careful with some of these negative stereotypes. Uh, actually, I was saying that when I was four to seven, I like, there were different conversations, of course, but like, mom didn't say anything. I was like, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. So, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I, at first, I was thinking, I was like, should we just be like super real with our kids from day one? They come out of the room and it's like institutional racism is real, you know, like, you know. There was one time when mom slept in and didn't put out like the Easter like gifts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I found out that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny probably weren't real because she looked guilty when she said, go back to sleep. The Easter Bunny will come later. Mm. And, um, also, I don't know how I knew the kids didn't come from storks, but I just thought that doesn't make sense. Where do they come from? And so I talked to her about that. I think I was like four. But yeah, you said that kids aren't scientists. And I was like, yeah. well, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so going back to like like a, like an old uh human growth and development like a developmental psychology class and you start looking at piaget and the stages of cognitive development when kids are most likely to start forming these stereotypes right in the early stages from like the sensory motor pre-operational like they're still like really kind of basic and it's not until was it adolescence when they can start like dealing with more abstract concepts like where they are really like systematically approaching questions in a very like systematic kind of step-by-step -step way even before that they're very egocentric in their experiences and judgments about the world around them so pj argued that that um, not even all people got to that highest formal operation stage which is challenging because like to do algebra and understand imaginary numbers and what is justice and things like that require like more advanced critical thinking and this, uh, this ability to understand that like concepts are larger than what you can just see for yourself or, you know, feel and hold in this kind of sensory motor idea. So to tie it back into stereotyping, um, parents and family members and culture as a society should be very careful with what, what um, examples and models that they're exposing kids to because they don't know any different and they're trying to understand the world around them and they're just passively accepting any information that's prevented in front of them. It's a good point. Here's a rough transition of a slide, right? Uh, some of these prejudices can be about some of the big things that I've been talking about so far, or they could be preferring one nation to another nation. 
or they could be preferring one sports team to another team. And in fact, when you look at some of the examples over time of like how children have been indoctrinated to perpetuate these negative stereotypes, negative prejudices, and even act in really discriminatory ways, like in World War II, where you had the Hitler youth being um, um, conditioned in a way to think that, yes, this Aryan group is better than Jews and gays and gypsies and the mentally handicapped and all sorts of other like socially marginalized groups at the time. So, so when these stereotypes are first kind of formed in early childhood, there's, they continue to be reinforced throughout childhood and adulthood. So we've already talked, I think in chapter two or three, about the confirmation bias, how people are more likely to seek out information that confirms their initial beliefs. And when life comes up and they learn something that disconfirms their initial beliefs, they're more likely to either like dismiss it or counter it or kind of rebut it in some way. People don't like their, their own worldviews challenged. They don't like the way that they see the world being kind of shaken. So they tend to selectively seek out instances that confirm their own belief system. And you see that in stereotyping as well. So those initial beliefs that they had about how the world worked and who is good and who is bad and who's a threat and who isn't. And what you find is the same processes that you've talked about in your, in your learning classes along the way are still playing out for how people learn stereotyping. That sort of classical conditioning, right? That Pavlov dog approach. What happens is people um, take these neutral stimuli, someone that they've never seen before, right? Don't have any feelings towards. And then they start associating them with mom squeezing their hand and mom being really unnervous. And if mom looks really unnervous and squeezing your hand, it might make you feel kind of bad or feel kind of uneasy. And what happens if every single time that person walks around, mom starts acting that way? You're literally that Pavlov dog in that household, developing a classically conditioned response to be fearful of people who don't look like you. Um, at a more kind of interactive level on operant conditioning, think of like B.F. Skinner, John Watson, like the little Albert, you know, idea of the rats and the pigeons. You interact on the world, you do things, and then the world operates back on you with rewards and punishments. You might grow up in a household where you say a really like racist or sexist joke, and mom and dad say, hell no, like, we don't talk like that. Like, why would you even say something like that? And what you realize is, oh, when I act this way, that's not going to be rewarded, right? And that behavior would be punished. According to operant condition, you would be less likely to act that way in the future. Unfortunately, at other times, you might go to a party and say a joke and everyone starts laughing. And what you might find is, hey, like when I act this way, it gets a, you know, some sort of reinforcement from other people. I'm going to continue to do this in the future. And even if you aren't the one saying that joke or operating in a really kind of stereotype congruent way, even according to social learning, if you just watch other people being rewarded for that behavior, you're likely to pick up that lesson the same way. So like going back to, um, uh, what's the name, Albert Bandura and the Bowell doll study. When you watch other people being rewarded for behaving a certain way, you're likely to learn the exact same lessons yourself. Any, any, Questions about stereotypes and how they're learned and reinforced. Can you go re go over the classical conditioning example? Yeah. So don't worry about the like unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. Like that's your gen psych, that's your kind of learning psychology classes. But think of classical conditioning as a passive associative learning. So that is you walking down the street and seeing someone that you've never seen before, right? And all of a sudden mom gets really uncomfortable or dad gets really angry and says something, right? And you start associating, huh, you know, like we should feel angry or scared or threatened when someone like this looks or, you know, comes by. And what you start having is this sort of a passive association between the two. So then later on, when you see another person who looks like that, you tend to have the same reaction. 
and then operant conditioning is rewards and re, uh, is uh, uh, punishments and reinforcements, right? The world is like operating on you based on your own behavior. And then the social learning is you just watching other people. And if they're being rewarded for it, you're likely to learn the same lessons yourself. Any, anyone seen this movie at the bottom, American History X? Yes, no? It's really dark. It's a really good movie, though. Um, it's about an older brother who is a member of, what's it look like, a neo-Nazi or something like that, and his younger brother, who is young, uncritically accepting, learning all these very uh, negative stereotypes about others from his older brother, and how that kind of plays out throughout their lives, and older brother gets arrested and how you know has a change of heart and like can you learn stereotypes and then can you unlearn them over life so anyway it's a cool cool movie what was it called again american history x okay, thank you. It, it's really dark I, I mean it's probably rated r there's there's some graphic scenes in there but um the history of of stereotyping prejudice and discrimination in america is also really dark um, and looks like Raylene has a comment over here saying it's on Netflix and Showtime if anyone is interested. Very cool. That's awesome. My wife was also telling me about another movie that came out that I've been meaning to watch. I think it's on, what's it called? I'm blanking on it, but anyway, I'll think of it. Uh, let me take a quick break real quick. I hear my son. So let's take a five minute break. It's five. It's nine eleven right now. Let's come back at like nine fifteen. All right. Sorry about that. I'll be right back.
All right, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> my, um, uh, on a TMI level, my two-year-old son is potty trained, but you know, isn't, isn't like hyping by himself yet. So anyway, I just hear this like two-year-old screaming in there like, I pooped, I pooped. So it's like, let me rush in there and make sure everything's good. So anyway, that was that, <laughs> the reason for the break. So sorry about that. And, and then afterwards, it's like, all right, like you're all set up, like what do you need? Cause there's like, you know, cookies in there and like TVs going and like a little iPad, like the whole little like little kid dream set up. And he's like, I need everything. I need everything. Like I need some more juice. I need some more cookies. I need everything. It's like, yikes, bud. So, so anyway, sorry, sorry for that, that uh, impromptu break. Um, looks like a question's coming in on the side from Emily saying, can you ever fully unlearn stereotypes? Um, your stereotypes can change over time, but unfortunately stereotypes are automatically activated. Um, so we don't have control over like repressing the stereotypes or not thinking of them. Like they're going to come to mind automatically. But what we can do is stop the link between stereotyping and prejudice. So even if we, um, have those negative stereotypes we don't always have to uh you know express prejudice and even discriminate against other people based on that but unfortunately those stereotypes are automatic good question so are we ready to keep going yep okay um, you may be wondering like why people stereotype in the first place. I've been talking about how it could be functional when you have very little information to go off of to use anything, including group membership to try and predict the world around you. Um, uh, from a kind of social cognitive perspective, one of the reasons why people stereotype is because they use this representativeness heuristic, which is a fancy way of seeing people you know, classify others into a group and they, um, um, compare individuals to what they believe is like the prototype or the most like stereotypic member of that group and people have kind of stereotypes right they have these prototypes of what a terrorist looks like and they have prototypes of what an American looks like and they have prototypes of what a, a psych major looks like and a chemistry major and what a professor looks like so when someone comes along and seems to look just like that then in a purely like cognitively miserly way they use this representatives representative heuristic and say well you represent that cat that category really well so you must belong to that category and it's not like people are out there like critically challenging all their assumptions about the world all right they're passively accepting things until they're confronted differently another way that people can form stereotypes that are completely not true at all is this illusory correlation in which infrequent social groups um, are paired with rare behaviors. So this illusory correlation is this imaginary link, right? This illusory correlation, this imaginary link between rare groups and rare behaviors. So when two rare things co-occur, they tend to think that they're really, really strong. So the example would be, let's say that you you know, kind of walking around and you meet somebody and this person is from Timbuktu and you're like, whoa, that's cool. I don't know like anybody else from Timbuktu before. So you start asking about this person. It's like, so like, what do you like to do for fun? And this person's like, well, I really love riding unicycles. Really? Like, that's really cool. I don't know anyone else who rides unicycles. Like you're a part of a rare group, right? People from Timbuktu and you're engaged in this really rare behavior. So what happens is those two rare events get seared into your memory, right? You form a really strong correlation. So then later on, when you're at the airport and you see someone with luggage that says they, they, they come from Timbuktu, you say, oh, you're from Timbuktu? Like, don't you love, you know, riding unicycles? Like, no, like that's, that's a weird thing to ask, right? What you could find is let's say that like 1% of the people in Timbuktu ride unicycles and 1% of the people in America ride unicycles. So even though the rate might be exactly the same, if it's a rare event, 
like a rare behavior being paired with a rare group, you're going to form that stereotype more strongly, even though it could be occurring in the exact same rate in a larger population. So I think I saw a question or a comment come in. Yeah. Uh, it says, may you go back to the representative heuristic, please. So what I'll do is I'll post these slides online under, under our files as well. They're already posted. Oh, oh good, good. Yeah. Cool. So um, the reason why I'm talking about the illusory correlation, let me use a political example, not to pick on one party versus the other, but just to show of like what the implications of an illusory correlation might be. So like, what is the, the uh, base rate of someone like committing a crime? And it's pr pretty low, right? What you could find is that same base rate amongst American citizens versus undocumented immigrants. It could be, in fact, I believe it is, like the exact same rate. But what happens when you have a, a minority group, so this infrequent social group that people don't know a whole lot about, and a really rare behavior like, you know, like being a you know criminal you know drugs or something like that those rare events and rare behaviors get seared together in memory so people form stronger correlations where they're trying to understand what that minority group is like and they form these these illusory correlations about them and they're false like that same behavior occurs at the exact same rate with other groups but they believe very strongly that that rare behavior and the rare groups are kind of linked together does this make sense? Yeah, this like illusory correlation idea. It's like the same way of like, let's say that um, you get um, bitten by like a uh, Tibetan sheepdog or something. And you're like, that's weird. Like, it's weird that a dog would bite you, right? That's a rare behavior. And it's weird that like, you know about a Tibetan sheepdog, you know, it's like a really rare type of dog. You know, if it's a real thing, I might've just made it up. But let's say that like you, um, um, like one out of a hundred dogs, you know, will bite you. Like you've been around like mom and dad's dog and a bunch of dogs at the park and like one out of a hundred like golden retrievers and labs will like bite a human that same 1% of aggressiveness in other breeds could be the exact same thing for the one out of 100 aggressiveness in Tibetan sheepdogs, but because you have this really rare behavior paired with a really rare group, you might hold this stereotype really strongly that Tibetan sheepdogs are really aggressive, but not necessarily hold the same aggression stereotype about, about um, you know, um, golden retrievers and things like that. Make sense? Yeah, good, cool. The next thing I wanna talk about is something that I'm really passionate about. Your textbook touches on it and I wanna really hit home, up, hit home on this idea because knowledge is power. And I'll explain that in a second. One of the things that um, is really unfortunate and can lead to this um, ironic perpetuation of stereotypes is stereotype threat. So stereotype threat occurs when people realize that, hey, I'm a part of this social group and other people have negative stereotypes about my group, right? We live in a society, we know the groups that we belong to and we know that other people might hold stereotypes about us. And some of these stereotypes can be negative. So uh, there's a negative stereotype, for instance, that women are less good at math than men or something like that. So what happens when you're a woman taking a math test and all of a sudden you start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm the only woman in this classroom. You know what, the person giving me the math test like knows that I'm a woman and knows that, that this negative stereotype exists. What that can happen, what that situation will do is it will activate stereotype threat. It will cause the person from the negatively stereotyped identity to try harder to disconfirm that stereotype. So now they're thinking about the stereotype, they're, they're trying even harder to kind of disconfirm that, 
they're feeling a little bit more anxious, they're tying up their cognitive resources, thinking about other things. And the ironic thing is because now they're thinking about everything else besides the math questions on that test, they tend to perform poorer on that test. And that effect is referred to as stereotype threat. And the reason why people experience stereotype threat is because it leads to this disruptive concern. And social psychologists are still trying to narrow down whether that is anxiety or evaluation apprehension or like uh, spreading the cognitive resources too widely. But in short, like um, when people uh, worry about confirming a negative stereotype about their own group, it leads to this disruptive concern, which undermines their own performance on that task. And let me hit you with a lot of examples of, of this because there's unfortunately a lot of stereotypes out there. The first one um, involved racial differences in intelligence on the GRE. So the GRE stands for the um, general record, or excuse me, the graduate record exam. Um, and it's like the SAT on steroids. It's like the SAT got you into college, the GRE gets you into graduate school. And the questions on the GRE are insanely tough. It's like really, really, really challenging where people aren't doing great. Like, I mean, they're designed to be as hard as they can possibly be. And when you give both black and white participants this test and say, hey, this, this um, um, you know, like here are these questions, do your best, right? And they don't know what those questions are. There's no racial differences in intelligence, right? Well, how do you see black participants and white participants are answering just about the exact same number of questions, right? There's no significant difference here. As I've been saying earlier, like there's no racial differences in intelligence. But let's say that the person giving the jury says, you know what, this test is diagnostic of intelligence. What that does is it activates stereotype threat for the black participants in there who realize, hey, I'm a part of this marginalized identity and other people have negative stereotypes that my group might not be as intelligent compared to other groups. And what happens, as soon as you activate stereotype threat by saying, hey, this test is diagnostic of your intelligence, what happens? is black scores decrease, but white participant scores don't change at all. There's no differences in intelligence between black and white participants until you activate stereotype threat. And it leads to this disruptive concern that undermines performance. Um, the uh, same thing happens in other contexts as well. If you give that GRE test, and, and the uh, first question that you ask is, what is your race, right? What you've just done is made their, their, their race salient, right? You brought it to the front of their mind, so they're thinking about it. As soon as you make their race salient, you're like, oh, that's right, like, I'm a part of this group and there's a negative stereotype about my group on how we perform on these verbal intelligence tasks. What happens is you activate stereotype threat for black participants, but not for white participants and black participant scores decreased. Whereas if you don't ask that dumb question about their race, there's no difference between their scores whatsoever because there is no racial differences in intelligence. This is terrifying for anyone who's ever taken like the SAT because for the longest time before you would take the test is they would ask you all sorts of questions of like, what is your race? What is your gender? How much money does your family make? Like the household income, like they would ask all these questions, which were just kind of priming and making salient all these social identities that people belong to, as well as some of the negative stereotypes that people know are associated with their group. So thankfully now what they've done, the GRE and the SAT and all those standardized tests have moved all of these demographic questions to the very end because asking about them at the beginning was creating bias only for black participants in this case. They've replicated the stereotype threat over and over and over again. Um, one of my favorite replications was with the Stanford, or Stanford prison was with the uh, Stanford football team. So on the Stanford prison, uh, I keep saying Stanford prison, on the Stanford football team, you had white athletes, black athletes, and there are different stereotypes about black football players and white football players. There's the stereotype that the white football players, like white men can't jump, that they're less athletic, 
but they're really good at like learning a playbook and learning the plays and the ins and outs of the games and things like that. And then there's the other stereotype for, for black football players is that they're really athletic, but they struggle with the playbook and things like that. What they did at Stanford University is gave both the black and white football players on that football team the exact same test. In one condition, they said, hey, you know, black and white football players on the Stanford you know, football team, this test is diagnostic of your physical ability. It's a bunch of questions and it does a really good job of predicting how well you can like run really fast and jump really high and like demonstrate your athletic prowess in the field. And what you found is as soon as you said, this test is diagnostic of your athletic ability, white participant scores went down. When you gave this exact same test to another group of football players on the Stanford football team and said, hey, this test is diagnostic of your ability to learn the playbook, black participant scores went down. It was the exact same test. There should have been no difference between the two, but what happened as soon as you activate, oh, it's about athletic ability, the white participants experienced stereotype threat and they scored significantly lower versus in the, black, in, in the other condition where you said this test is diagnostic of intelligence, activated stereotype for the black participants and their scores decreased. You see the same thing with, with um, uh, activating gender stereotypes um, in math tests and things like that. One of my um, favorite ways of like playing around with this stereotype threat occurred um, with Asian women taking a math test. And what's interesting about Asian women taking a math test is that they are part of multiple you know, social groups, right? They have their gender identity, right? Being a woman, which has a negative math stereotype about it, but they also have their racial identity about being Asian, which has a positive stereotype about their math ability on it. And when you give Asian women a bunch of these questions from the math portion of the GRE, they're really, really difficult. And what you find is that they get about half of them right on average. If right before you give them that, these math questions from the GRE, if you ask them, hey, what is your ethnicity? If you ask them about their ethnicity, they're like, yeah, I'm Asian. Notice that they do significantly better. This is referred to as stereotype lift. You've reminded them, hey, you're a part of a group that has a positive stereotype about this. And they did significantly better. If you ask Asian women about their gender identity right before, they do significantly worse. This is stereotype threat. There should be no difference here. Right? You randomly assign women to get these three conditions to activate racial identity, gender identity, or no identity whatsoever. These bars should not differ at all. The fact that they do, that's bias kind of built into the testing system by just asking, excuse me, these, these questions about their identity to activate either stereotype lift or stereotype threat, which is terrifying, right? Terrifying given the implications of how people score on the GRE opens the door for certain graduate programs and how people score on the SAT opens the door for various colleges, things like that. So the, um, the implications of stereotype threat are huge. But the reason why I've been talking so much about it and showing like graph after graph after graph to really explain what, what this is and why it's occurring is because when people learn about what stereotype threat is, the effect goes away. So if you know, hey, this is what stereotype threat is, it activates disruptive concern, which undermines performance. As soon as you know what stereotype threat is, there's no difference. You don't experience the same sort of stereotype threat dip in performance just by knowing about it. If the experimenter giving you that test says, you know what? Yeah, some people think this test is, is diagnostic, but I don't. As soon as that experimenter like kind of disconfirms the stereotype, stereotype threat goes away. If that experimenter is wearing a t-shirt that says erase racism, the effect goes away, which is really, really, really great to show that there are things that people and institutions can do to, to uh, decrease stereotype threat. Um, so let's see here, I experienced a question over here. Um, a while ago from 
Uh, Caitlin uh, experienced that when driving since there's a stereotype that women can't drive. Yeah, absolutely. There's all sorts of stereotypes. Some of these are positive, some of these are negative. And when you realize that you're a member of a negatively stereotyped group, you can experience stereotype threat when you're evaluated in that domain. Isn't that cool? It usually, um, it gets worse if like um, the passenger in my car is a man and they, they comment on it while I'm driving. Mm-hmm. So, um, was it was it 1910 or 1930s? Like an old study looked at um, um, mm -hmm. women can drive. Um, what it looked at was how you can uh, activate different identities just by the people around you. So, so when you have a um, a uh, black student sitting in a class full of white students in Kansas, one of the things that they say is like, I feel black. Like I'm really like cognizant of the fact that like, I'm the only black student in this classroom right now, right? The same way if you take a white participant and put them in a classroom full of a bunch of other black students, all of a sudden like the fact that they're white like is really salient to them in that moment. You know, it may not be salient at any other time when they're around their family or, or you know, around other people that, that are a lot more, you know, heterogeneous. But it's only when like they're they're in that situation where it's like I'm different, or the person next to me is a man, and they might have this stereotype about me about being a woman driver. Just having that person there activates the stereotype, which probably stresses you out, right? You're like, no, no, you're really focusing on like, should I stop or go, or should I use yeah. my turn signal? And now you're distracted, right? You're like stressed out. You're thinking it's more sort about of like, the stereotype. Um, is it like self fulfilling prophecy? Yeah, yeah. Almost. Mm -hmm. That's one way of thinking about it. In the self-fulfilling okay. prophecy, um, it involves an interaction with someone else. So like, so like the step one is you have this belief, changes how you respond to someone else, and then they respond in kind in a way that confirms your initial belief. Whereas in the stereotype threat, it's all internal. The person mm -hmm. next to you doesn't have to be interacting with you at all. It doesn't have to say like, oh, I believe this stereotype or not, just them being there, you know, stresses you out, gives your, um, uh, makes you feel more anxious and leads to that sort of disruptive concern. But yeah, it has the same idea of like a self-fulfilling prophecy of leading to its own fulfillment. Okay. Cool. Good question. So let's keep going. So that's all stereotyping. Prejudice is this feeling, so it's negative evaluation. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to measure prejudice over time. Some of these are explicit measures, which is just a fancy way of saying, just ask people, hey, how do you feel towards this group or that group? One of my personal favorite ways is just asking them on a feeling thermometer. Say, hey, on a you know, 100 point scale from zero to 99. Zero being very cold, very unfavorable attitudes to 99 being very warm and very favorable attitudes. How do you feel towards people that go to APU or people that go to Citrus? Or how do you feel towards women in general or men in general? And look at, you know, are there differences here in which people feel more positively towards some groups than other groups? Um, the problem with that is some people lie, right? Some people, um, like to see themselves as being egalitarian, as treating everyone equally and loving everyone the same and not being prejudiced towards any group at all. So they might lie. They might purposely misrepresent their prejudicial attitudes to not show that they are more racist or sexist or homophobic than they actually are. So one of the ways that they've kind of combated that um, is by studying more of this kind of like modern racism. So in the old studies where there was less of a stigma of coming across as being more prejudiced you could ask people very explicitly do you like think that this you know that people of this ethnicity or or uh, people of this religious belief um, should be able to move into your neighborhood like something like really blatant very blatantly explicitly racist and things like that um, Nowadays, people aren't endorsing questions like that. So what they've developed is more of these kind of modern racism scales where it's saying, hey, how much do you agree or disagree with like social statements like this? Like discrimination against blacks is no longer a problem in the United States, where it's not explicitly asking, 
are you racist? Well, what they find is that um, people's true levels of prejudice correlates really strongly with how much they're endorsing items like this. It's like, yeah, like discrimination against blacks is no longer a problem in the United States. People who believe that tend to score higher on measures of, of, of in this case, anti-black prejudice. Some other items like blacks are getting too demanding and they're pushed for equal rights. Blacks should not push themselves where they're not, blacks should not push themselves where they're not wanted. And items like, you know, like I would never vote for a black governor, things like that. People are a lot more comfortable saying, oh yeah, like I wouldn't vote for that person or yeah, discrimination is no longer an issue. They feel a lot more kind of comfortable revealing how they truly feel to those items. Um, and those reveal their, their, their true level of anti-black prejudice. So all of this to say, social psychologists are getting really creative in how they measure prejudice because people lie. And you find historical trends where explicit prejudice tends to decrease over time. Um, and then when you start breaking it down based on age, you start looking at uh, what percentage of people are agreeing with modern racism scores? Like, it's really a matter of some people not trying hard enough. If blacks would only really try harder, then they'd be just as well off as whites. One of these items from the modern racism scale, which is capturing explicit prejudice. And what you find is um, um, there are age differences over time, whereas white participants are more likely to express anti-black prejudice when they're older. And they're not, there's a couple of different reasons why this might be. Some folks are arguing more of like a generational kind of cohort that they've been exposed when they were kids to a lot more explicit racism. The other argument is more of, of a cognitive deterioration of like the self-control that younger people would exhibit and saying, you know what, like, I don't want to be viewed this way. I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm not going to say that, even though I'm aware of what the stereotype might be. Older folks lacking that same level of self-control are like, you know, letting things come out of their mouth that they would have never let come out when they were younger. So, so some people believe it's like, it's a, a time of like when grandpa was really young, you learn things that, that have changed over time. Other folks argue that, that, the only reason why grandpa's appearing more racist when he's older is because of the decreased self-control. Any, any, any questions about like the modern racism scale and this kind of pattern of results? What you're also finding is a kind of diverging trend as well. So that like older black participants are less likely to endorse these stereotypes as well. So there's a lot more of a kind of racial divide in modern racism scores for older participants as compared to younger participants, which again would support the, the uh, cohort idea. Some other, other examples of modern racism, um, actually the percentage of white respondents that are agreeing with a couple items that black and white students should go to separate schools or that I would move if a black family moved in next door. Uh, it breaks my heart to see like in 1940, like almost 70% of white participants believing in segregation. And in 1960, about half of white participants saying like, I would move if a black person moved in next door. That breaks my heart, that's terrible. But what is refreshing is to see this decrease over time, this decrease in explicit prejudice. So now, right, actually we're probably even further over here in you know, 2020, showing that a very, very, very small percent of people would endorse this explicit item of like, I would move if a black person moved in next door. Unfortunately, the implicit racism measured by the IAT hasn't shown as steep a negative decrease over time. So um, if you're interested in measuring uh, you know, anti-black prejudice, the modern racism scale is a good way to go. There's other types of, of prejudice to measure as well, one of them being sexism, so disliking or evaluating negatively someone because you know, they're male or female. 
um, there's, there's a couple of ways of like slicing down sexism. So like kind of anti-woman prejudice. There's benevolent sexism and hostile sexism. So benevolent sexism is still endorsing these like very limiting and negative stereotypes about women, but it's doing so in the guise of like a nice way. It's saying things like, you know what, like, you know, women are wonderful. Um, they, they're more moral, more kind, more generous, more loving than men. If you have a hard day, like go talk to mom, like go open up to a woman about your problems. Like that's a, a stereotype, right? You're making this blanket judgment about who is more moral and kind and generous, and emotionally open. So like you're making a stereotype, but it's a positive stereotype. So it's like, it's, it's still sexism, but it's coming across in this kind of benevolent way. The same way you have some fathers tell their kids like, you know, like, you know, the little girls are like, you know, these like wonderfully delicate flowers, like you need to protect them. You need to be nice to them. You need to like, make sure that like, you don't, you know, say or do um, like that, you know, like expose them to something that's going to like make them feel bad. It's like, they are like women are people, right? There's the, you know, they are um, these uh, delicate, like fragile flowers. It's like, that's sexism. Like you're treating someone differently because of this, this, um, the sexist belief that you have, even though it's coming from this kind of benevolent place so benevolent sexism. The other type of sexism is a lot more kind of hostile. So a lot more direct in its negativity. You know, those stereotypes of women being more like controlling and like the ball and chain in the relationship, you know, they're, 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 some guys that will make comments like, Oh, sorry, I can't go out. You know, like the old ball and chain. It's like, what that's literally saying is like, you are not free that you are shackled to this weight that's keeping you back from running at your fullest from being and living the life that you want to. It's like, that's an incredibly sexist statement to say, or things like, well, like that guy is whipped or that guy you know, has, you know, that guy is on a leash. It's assuming that like, that, that you have this kind of hostile sexist belief that she is like controlling the partner and dictating where the guy gets to go and things like that. So a lot more direct in its negativity, but both of these would be considered sexism. One is more benevolent, one is more hostile. Is this something that you guys have heard about, experienced, you, you, have, you have similar examples? Yeah, some head nods. You see, even today, uh, sexist double standards, particularly when it comes to like warmth and competence. So um, let's say you have two people, you know, working, one's a man, one's a woman, and both of them are doing their job well. So both are seen as competent. Um, there's the positive benevolent stereotype that women tend to be warmer than men. What happens is when you have those two competent employees, one's a man, one's a woman, the woman who is benefiting from being perceived as both competent and warm, as soon as she has a kid, people now perceive her as being significantly less competent at her job. Whereas the guy, right, the guy has a kid, his competence doesn't take a hit at all. In fact, he now gets a boost. So now he's seen as both warm and competent. They're both the same, right? They're both people. One's a man, one's a woman. They both had kids. The sexist double standard comes up as now when, when you have a working mom now being seen as less competent and a working dad now being seen as more warm. They both experience the exact same thing. They both had a kid, but now notice how people's sexist perceptions change of them. I think it was during, um, like, I can't remember what year it is, but it was the years when, like, I Love Lucy was big and stuff. She had to, like, bring her kids on set with her, and they had to, like, recreate, like, her front yard so that if paparazzi were walking by and they would get pictures of her kids, it would be, like, on their front yard so people would stop saying that she was, like, you know, um, a, a, a mother that didn't care about her kids or she would take her kids to work. Like, they had to set it up to make it look like, oh, she's still working, but she's still being a mother, oh which was gosh. just stupid. 
And then another example that I just thought of that I could have mentioned earlier is like men are funnier than women. Like it's just perceived that women aren't good comedians or that like any jokes we make are never as funny as when men do them. Mm -hmm. Like I'm on the improv team. So I see that quite a bit. Yeah, even even within politics, you see questions of like, well, how likable and electable is this candidate? And there's like some dog whistles in that of like, why are, why are we only asking questions about likability and electability for some candidates but not others? And really, what does that mean to be electable? Like, electable is who gets the most votes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but yeah, people can can uh, can have their sexist beliefs and prejudiced beliefs kind of leak out in, in all sorts of various domains, unfortunately. In fact, the same thing happened when, when Barack Obama was running for the first time. There was a lot of uncertainty about how that election would go because you're worried about like, well, there's some people who are saying that they would vote for him, but what's really going to happen in the privacy of a voting booth when no one else is around? Are they just saying that they, they would vote for him because they don't want to come across as, as, as racist or is that really what they believe? Um, this is an oldie but goodie. Remember the show, Stranger Things? It's an example of, of sexism, right? Benevolent sexism of the kids got sucked into the underworld, right? Spoiler alert. I think it came out a few years ago. Um, the mom is worried. The mom is like freaking out, is like concerned, is going after her kids. The dad over here is aloof, like doesn't even know that his kids are gone to like the last scene of the movie, right? Perpetuating some of these uh, sexist stereotypes about who should be involved and things like that. Um, there's also prejudice directed towards couples, uh, which is my research interest on why some, some couples are more likely to experience negative stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination. You see the same thing with like age gap couples. So like the cougars, the cradle robbers, even using those stereotype terms, what you're re referring to is this basic inequality in the relationship that like a guy dating an older woman, like that's a cougar, this predatory animal who's taking advantage, right? Or a older guy dating younger, that's a uh, cradle robber, right? Or like a, like, a, a, like a grave digger or grave digger, gold digger. The person is like, um, uh, going after this person just for his money. It's not something more than that. Like all of that kind of language kind of built into how we describe couples is revealing our negative stereotypes and prejudices towards them. Um, the same thing happens for, for let's see here in this study. Um, I think it was in Houston, Texas um, in 2000. What they did was want to kind of look at the um, relational prejudice towards being gay. And what they did is had research assistants try to apply for a job. And these were just kind of research assistants, kind of just average folks. And they were walking into this kind of strip mall, going from you know, store to store, applying for jobs. And before they walked in to apply for that job, they put a hat on their head. And they didn't know what it was. In one condition, the hat said Texan and proud. In the other condition, it said gay and proud. So they manipulated right? People's impression of whether this person is gay or straight, just given the hat that was on their head and the persons themselves didn't know. And the participant would ask questions of like, you know, hi, like, are you guys hiring? Can I get some application materials to complete? Would you mind if I used your bathroom? And what you found is every candidate applying for the job was given the application materials. There wasn't any, um, any like overt prejudice when it came to that, or in this case, discrimination. There wasn't any overt discrimination when it came to that. Every participant was allowed to use the bathroom at the same rate, but folks wearing the gay and proud hat were significantly less likely to get called back for an interview. So like that face to face, that overt of like, I'm not gonna give you this paper. Or I'm not gonna let you use the bathroom. People were, um, were not discriminated in that context. When it came to the more kind of superficial judgments of like, well, should we call this person? That's when you saw this anti-gay prejudice kind of creeping out. You also saw this in the number of words used in these conversations. You notice that in the gay and proud condition, the conversations are shorter. It's like, so like, tell me what it's like to work here. Oh, it's good. It's all right. 
versus in the other condition, oh yeah, you do this and this, and this is what our hours are like, and the manager's really great, like knows how the conversation is differing based on their anti-gay prejudice. Words used, interaction length. And then after the participant left the store, they didn't know what hat they were wearing. So they took it off without looking at it, and they rated on a one to five scale, how negative do you think that interaction went? And what you found is even though participants didn't know what hat they were wearing, the folks that were actually wearing the gay and proud condition, you know, hat rated that interaction as significantly more negative than the Texan and proud condition. So even though they didn't know what hat they were wearing, they still picked up on, hey, that person wasn't very nice to me. The conversation was shorter, they didn't talk as much, and they just got the kind of feeling that this wasn't a positive experience. You see the um, uh, same levels of stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination with interracial couples. Um, in fact, it, it, it breaks my heart. It wasn't until 1967 in the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case that blacks and whites were le legally even allowed to marry one another, which blows my mind. It was like 1967. You see the same relational prejudice when it comes to age gap couples. And more recently, you see the same prejudice coming uh, across to mixed weight couples. So like a mixed weight couple being a skinnier person partnering with someone who's overweight. In a couple of studies I did last year, a couple of years ago, we presented people with couples of someone who is really skinny, dating someone who is, who is overweight in comparison to themselves, and asked them all sorts of questions of like, hey, how much do you like this couple being together? And what you found was a real clear pattern that looked like this. That if you have two healthy people, a healthy guy dating a healthy girl, people love that couple being together, right? They like them together. If you have an overweight guy dating an overweight girl, people like that couple being together, just slightly less than two skinny people, right? So like a, like a cultural preference for skinny versus overweight. But what this is showing is that when you have matched couples, two skinny people, two overweight. People love those couples being together, but as soon as you have a mixed weight couple, right, a skinny person partnering with an overweight partner, people really dislike those couples being together. So people are expressing prejudice, and this was an explicit item, just, hey, how much do you like this couple? We followed that up in more kind of nuanced studies where we asked people to play matchmaker. So say, hey, like, imagine you have this really skinny friend or a friend who looks like this, and the picture was really someone who was overweight, and said, hey, like, you know, design the perfect match for this person. You know, what hair color would this person have? What eye color? How tall would this person be? And how heavy do you think this person should be? What should be their weight? And what you found is people, um, when, when they played matchmaker, they paired their skinny friends with, with a skinny partner and their overweight friends with an overweight partner. We pushed the envelope even further and started asking people about like dating advice. So we created like a fake matchmaking website, kind of like match.com and said, Hey, like, you know, we have some couples that, that have already, you know, been like, you know, set up, they're planning on going on dates, but we want to kind of crowdsource some dating advice for them. How much money should this couple spend on a date? Should they go to a private place or a public place, right? Should they go to like, um, a concert in the park where they'd see a bunch of people or should they go to a really dark movie theater where no one would ever see the person that they're dating? Should they display affection, right? Should they give this person a hug or a kiss at the end of the date? How long should they wait to introduce this person to their friends and family? And what you found is on average, when you have two skinny people together or two overweight people together, they gave them great dating advice. But for these mixed weight couples, right, these dissimilar couples, what you found is people saying, dark movie theater, cheaper restaurant, wait longer to introduce them to your friends and family and less likely to display affection, which was rough. Really, really rough. Just to see like the ease at which people would express these, uh, this prejudice and discriminatory dating advice. So anyway, if you're curious about couples and prejudice and things like that and interested in, in um, doing research in the future, you're more than welcome to take that Psych 475 class. Reach out to me. I'm looking for, you know, for folks to join my research team in the fall. So anyway, 
side note plug. If this is cool and you're into this stuff, we can chat more. So that's all the explicit prejudice. Luckily, we can also measure people's um, automatic kind of true levels of prejudice via the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. And I'm not gonna spend too much time going over this because we already talked about it earlier in our chapter on attitudes. But basically what the IAT is looking at is reaction time. So how quickly are people uh, automatically making associations of white and good and black and bad? And if people are making that association really, really quick, it's showing this implicit level of racism. Whereas if people show the opposite pattern of like white and bad takes a long time and black and good takes a long time, then that would also show this pattern of being implicitly racist. And what you show is the vast majority of people, 54% uh, have a moderate to strong automatic preference on an implicit level for white faces compared to black faces. Even more than that, what's that? Almost 70, yeah, 54, yeah. 70% have at least a slight preference for white compared to black faces. Um, and what's interesting about this is you can look at like an individual difference, right? Given that people have varying degrees of implicit prejudice, what does that predict? Does that predict their likelihood to, you know, to hire someone for a job? No, but it does hire how far away you sit during that interview it does predict that kind of automatic behavior that people engage in without even thinking of like, how often am I smiling at this person? How long did I reach out and shake this person's hand for? What you find out is that people's implicit attitudes could do a good job of predicting their automatic behavior that kind of occurs without them even thinking about it. Um, in a really depressing study, um, a few years ago, some colleagues and I gave people the IAT, this black, white IAT. And right before we got to this slide and told them about how they specifically scored in comparison to other people, we said, do you want to find out what your results are? Just FYI, this test might tell you whether you're implicitly racist or not. Do you want to find out what your results are? And what we found out is a third of people. So 33% of people are like, no, I'm good. I know that I'm not racist and I don't need your test to tell me that I'm not. But for most people, right, who consider themselves egalitarian, right, most people don't think that they're racist. The IAT is shattering that misconception for about 70% of people. It's saying now, like, most people are showing a, 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 uh, at least a slight, moderate, or strong automatic preference for uh, white faces compared to black faces. So it was kind of disconcerting to see people just not even want to take the IAT and find out what the results, because it would challenge their self view that they're egalitarian. Dr. Colson, have you heard of the book, uh, White Fragility? I've heard about it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Okay, I'm in the middle of reading it and I like extremely recommend it. Oh, cool. Um, like if you ever have like random time, uh, it might actually be like, um cool to read before your research experience too yeah um, but yeah it's basically about why it's so hard for white people specifically to talk about racism and like you just reminded me of it because of what you said about how people didn't even want to take the test um and the author kind of dives into like the fact that white people can't talk about racism because they like think that they're above that way of thinking but they also don't want to be told that they're wrong about the stereotypes or like prejudices that like they've made. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I'm not super far into it. So like, I'll keep you updated, but um, it sounds like yeah, a really cool I book. super recommend it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm not teaching any classes this summer, so I'll put that on my summer reading list for sure. Awesome. It sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the way the IAT research is kind of shifted more now is, you know, not showing that like, yes, you can measure people's implicit attitudes. It is predictive. They've already shown that, but kind of moving over to like, well, why do people care? Like, how can we, you know, start, you know, training people differently? Because unfortunately what you see is those implicit attitudes that people have kind of creeping out into their behavior 
like police officers when they have to make a decision to shoot versus not shoot in the fraction of a second when someone's pulling out you know a wallet or a weapon you have to make this snap snap decision and what you find is do people's implicit attitudes predict their behavior in those situations and the answer is yes and this was never more apparent than in new york with amino diallo so for those of you that don't know amino diallo he was a grad student at NYU, came over uh, from Africa, didn't speak really great English, but was learning and was doing really well in college. Um, what Amin Diallo was doing on the weekend was kind of walking around outside of his building. And what he didn't realize is that there was a serial rapist in the same area that looked a lot like Amin Diallo. It wasn't him, but someone who kind of fit his description kind of looked a lot like Amin Diallo. And the police had been looking for the serial rapists over and over and over again, could not find this guy. And what they decided to do is, well, let's go undercover. Instead of wearing our uniforms, let's start wearing kind of street clothes and our regular car. We'll roll down the windows. We'll just kind of cruise through these streets, see if we find someone who meet, looks like someone who fits the description, someone who looked a lot like Amin Diallo. So you had these white police officers in New York kind of driving around and they see Amin Diallo walking and then they say, hey, that, that looks like our guy. So they yell and scream, hey, you freeze. And Amin Diallo gets a little scared, like who are these you know, people screaming at him from their car window? So he ignores them and keeps walking. Say, no, no, hey, you freeze. And now the police officers are pulling over and getting out of their car. Amin Diallo is now getting really scared that these people are you know, yelling at him, you know, pulling over, coming out of their car after him. So Amin Diallo starts walking faster. The police officers, who he doesn't even know are police officers because they're dressed undercover, are running up even faster on him now. Amin Diallo, Diallo starts running back towards his apartment. He gets his apartment, runs all the way up the stairs into the door frame for his, you know, for his apartment door, and then realizes, oh, like I know why these people are trying to stop me. They're probably trying to stop me because they don't know if I'm here legally or not. Let me show them my green card. Let me show them my paperwork. So at the top of the stairs, backlit by the opening of his door, Amr Diallo reaches into his back pocket and pulls out his wallet to show him. And in the split second, you had these police officers who are wondering like, why this person is running for them, all of a sudden stops, turns around and reaches into his pocket for something. In a split second of, in the fraction of a second they had to make a decision, shoot versus not shoot. Is this a wallet or is this a gun? And in their case, they shot Amin Diallo. In fact, I believe he was shot 50 times in total. The first, off, the first officer shot the recoil, knocked him back off the steps. So the, the second, third officer re unloaded the rest of their clips, shot Amin Diallo uh, many, many times, and Amin Diallo ended up dying. And in the aftermath, there was all... <sighs> a lot of uh, really important justifiable like kind of uproar of would this have happened if Amin Diallo was white? Did the race of the person pulling out either a wallet or a gun, like does that affect police officers' decision to shoot versus not shoot? Was it, you know, like racist cops, did their own racial attitudes kind of creep into this? Those are all empirical questions, right? Those are all things that, that social psychologists can test. In fact, they did, excuse me, they created the shooter effect at University of Colorado, where they would bring participants into a computer, you know, like, like, like in front of a computer screen and say, hey, I'm gonna show some people, and I want you to make a decision on the keyboard as fast as you can to shoot or not shoot. And they would show participants that were either white or black, that were holding a weapon or a non-weapon. And they would make a decision like, hey, what should you do here? And if someone looked at it and says, well, that looks like a cell phone, don't shoot. If it took them too long to make that decision, they say, no, like, this needs to be like, in the moment as fast as you possibly can. So too slow, we aren't you know, recording that, incentivizing them to even go faster. So they'd flash up more pictures, and all of a sudden someone would pop up and they'd say, okay, like, should I shoot or not shoot? In this case, the person's holding a gun. They'd say, yep, that's a gun. You should make the decision to shoot in this situation. And notice how that they started manipulating the race of the person. And every now and then, you'd see someone holding a cell phone. And if you made the, the incorrect decision to shoot an unarmed, right, innocent person, 
really discouraged that. It's like, no, 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 like negative 40 points for something like that. Like you made the wrong decision here. So what's really interesting about this, this experiment is not only do you have reaction time varying by race and weapon, but you also have accuracy. Did you make the right decision or not? And it, these were their findings. So I'll give you a second here to kind of marinate over this a little bit. The big takeaways here, the first one that jumps out, people are quicker to make a, um, are quicker to make a decision when someone is holding a gun, right? Like these two bars over here, when someone is holding a gun, people process that information faster than when they're processing like a wallet or a cell phone, right? Which makes sense from like a threat perspective. But also notice that there's an interaction here. So, so when someone is armed, it matters whether they're black or not. People are significantly faster, right? Shorter reaction time to make a decision to shoot or not shoot if it's a black person holding a gun than a white person holding a gun. Over, over here, when you have a white person, excuse me, a white person holding a cell phone, right? A white person who's unarmed, you're more likely, to, you know, like, or you're quicker to say, no, don't shoot, than over here, than if it's a black person holding a cell phone or a wallet. It takes them a little bit longer to process that. And then when you look at the errors, you again show this really intriguing interaction. So does it matter that Amin Diallo was, was black? Yeah, it does. When you have, um, uh, let's see here, like the number of errors. So when you have a white person holding a gun and a black person holding a gun, you're much more likely to make an error and say, don't shoot an unarmed white person than you would an, uh, or you're more likely to make an error of saying, don't shoot an armed white person than an armed black person. And over here is Amadiallo's Diallo's case. You are much more likely to make the error of saying shoot an unarmed black person than saying shoot an unarmed white person. This interaction is why Amadiallo Diallo died. Right? It, it did depend on the race of the person pulling out the weapon or not. Which is really important for psychologists to know it's important for police officers to know and leads to all sorts of questions of like well this was just with college students at university of colorado what about with denver pd so they took police officers right and gave them the exact same thing and what they found is that police officers made decisions much faster than your college students which makes sense right police officers are kind of trained on this Police officers were quicker to make decisions and they made less errors in general, right? Because they're kind of you know, trained on this, they have a lot more experience on this, but their same pattern of results showed up the exact same way. There was still an interaction, although like cops made fewer errors, they still showed that, that, that racial difference where they were more likely to um, shoot an unarmed black person than an unarmed white person. After that, they looked at both white and black participants to see if white participants would show this effect to a greater degree. And they showed that both white and black participants showed the same sort of shooter effect here, the same short, sort of pattern of errors. And that's because the same negative stereotypes aren't just going to one group of people, but not another. They're perpetuated in society. So people hold these stereotypes about their own groups as well as other groups. Um, and some really cool recent studies on the shooter effect is having people um, uh, do the test while having an MRI done, and they look at amygdala activation. And what they show is that um, amygdala activation predicts their scores on this kind of shooter effect. Specifically, the people whose amygdala is going nuts, right? The amygdala is saying fear, freak out, right? the more they're showing more of this kind of fear, like threatening feeling, the more likely they are to make these errors by, by accidentally shooting an unarmed black person as compared to an unarmed white person. And when you give people the IAT right beforehand, you show that their scores in the IAT predict their score of the shooter effect.
any any questions about that about All right, so let's keep going here. Um, let's let's switch gears a little bit and start talking about some like theories about why people are prejudiced. The first theory that gets a lot of traction is an individual difference, that you know just some people are more prejudiced than others, and they argue that some people are um, score higher in the social dominance orientation, which is a fancy way of saying that they are motivated to have one group kind of dominate the other. That there's some people believe that there is kind of inherent inequity within society, and that's how for people who are high in social dominance orientation think that it should be. You should have the top one percent and you know the bottom. You should have the high status, the dominant, the people who have access to resources, and the other groups below them having less less access, less success. And what you find is that um, people who tend to make more money, tend to be um, uh, uh, white in America and have more of this kind of social privilege, tend to score higher in social dominance orientation. So they're motivated to maintain, you know, in this case, their own kind of group dominance over other groups. After the alt-right rally in Charlottesville, you had social psychologists sending out personality surveys anonymously online and asking people, hey, do you identify as all right? And what you find is that the people who do, first of all, there aren't a ton of them, but of the people who, who do identify with the alt right, scored off the charts on social dominance orientation. Another source of prejudice is scapegoat theory which has had some mixed evidence. What scapegoat theory is arguing that people will uh, uh, regulate their own feelings about themselves by hating on others. So like who, who, who can I scapegoat? Who can I blame for things not going well with me? And some of the evidence for it is a correlational study showing that the um, price of cotton sales in the South was, um, was correlated with the amount of lynchings in the South. So when the price of cotton was down, the lynchings went up. So they argued from this kind of scapegoat theory that when people were like economically frustrated, they were lashing out. What I find a little bit more convincing evidence for scapegoat theory is showing that when you threaten people by giving them bad feedback on a test, they tend to express more prejudice towards outgroups as a way of saying like, but even though I may not have scored well on this test, my group that I belong to is still better than other groups. So there is some both correlational and experimental evidence for this kind of scapegoating idea. Another theory that's received a lot more support is realistic conflict theory. Realistic conflict theory gets brought up over and over and over again, across time, across situations. It does a really nice job of explaining why you would hate other groups specifically. Realistic conflict theory argues that prejudice arises when there's competition between groups for scarce or limited resources. So if there's only so much of the pie to go around and they, the others, like are getting more pie, then that means that there's less pie for us. You know, this idea that there's only limited resources to go around. This explains why you see in um, Folks who are lower SES, so less educated, more of this kind of like working kind of manual labor jobs, uh, especially in the South, are showing the most prejudice towards undocumented immigrants. And they're saying hateful things like, you know, they're stealing our jobs, things like that. And they're operating under this kind of realistic conflict assumption that there's only so many jobs to go around. And if they, in this case, the undocumented immigrants, take more jobs, and that means that there's less for us. Um, so given realistic conflict th theory, if there's competition over limited resource, then either group should really dislike the other. You see the same thing, uh, with the conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine, right? There's only so much holy land to go around. Both groups think that it's theirs and they should own it. And if other groups get more holy land, then that means that there's less for themselves. Any, any questions about realistic conflict theory or any other examples of it you guys can think of? Yeah. 
So for scapegoat yeah. theory and realistic conflict theory, I kind of got them confused with your examples. Like they're both competition based in a way. Scapegoat theory is more like, how can I make myself feel better by blaming someone else? Okay. If life's not going well for me, like in general, how, how, how can I at least feel better about my safe self by saying at least my group is better than that group? Okay. Yeah. And then a realistic conflict theory, it's saying like they're both competing over the exact same limited resource. So okay. like, yeah, the same way at like college campuses where you let students know, Hey, there's only like so much scholarship money to go around. And these are you know, saying things, well, there's like affirmative action. So if this group gets more scholarships, I mean, your group gets less right? The people that like were competing for that scholarship, like the, they're the ones that are the most anti kind of against it because they see it as like, if other groups get more then that means that I get less. Okay. And in a cool study of this, you had Mustafer Sharif, a social psychologist at the university of Oklahoma, um, create his own summer camp for like these junior high kids. Uh, what he did is, um, uh, took these groups of kids and brought them out to Robbers cave national park and lied to them and said, hey, this is a summer class camp. What he didn't tell them was there were actually two different groups of, of kids that he bust out to Robbers Cave National Park. So as soon as he let them go, they both started exploring, then they bumped into each other. And they were like, who are you, right? As soon as they realized that they weren't the only group that was there anymore, the first thing that they did was name themselves, the Eagles and the Rattlers. And then who's for Sharif stepped in and said, well, we're going to play some games and we're, we're going to have, have some sort of competition go back and forth. So if the Eagles win a game of kickball, then they'll get some money that they can spend at the local store. If the you know, Rattlers win a game of tug of war, then they get to eat dinner first and things like that. So they were playing you know, game after game all day long that was incentivized where if one group wins, then they get a benefit and the other group loses. So they created this kind of realistic competition between the two. And what they um, uh, didn't plan is that the Eagles kept beating up on the Rattlers. So the Eagles kept winning game after game after kickball. And the first day was fine. It was all kind of lighthearted until the Eagles started like racking up some serious money. And the Eagles like, you know, started like going to, to eat lunch first and dinner first and got their first pick of all the food. And that started to piss the Rattlers off after a while. So then what you found is on the second day, these games got really competitive. So there was a lot of profanity. There was a lot of kind of cheap blows. Like the games like started to get a little rough. They started escalating really quickly. And then you saw um, after that, after that second day, when the Eagles kept winning and they went um, to eat, the Rattlers snuck over to the Eagles camp and threw rocks at it and like crushed all their tents and you know, destroyed a lot of their stuff while the Eagles were you know, eating. So after the Eagles finished, they switched, the Rattlers started to eat, the Eagles come back to their camp and realize that it's crushed. So what the Eagles did is set fire to the Rattlers camp. It's like that escalated quickly. You have pictures over here of them like kind of burning their flags and the, you know, the Rattlers got really pissed off. They come out. Now it's like escalating into this big like fight between the two and how easy it was to create this hatred and aggression in just two days, you know, of them like just having competition. So after that, who's for Sharif thought that it would take the entire week to like create these conditions necessary for prejudice and measure it. It only took two days. So then the, with the rest of the time, Musa Sharif said, well, if it was that easy to create prejudice, how can we reduce it? So what he did is that night where they were sleeping is he snuck up to their water reservoir, these big kind of tanks up top. And there was a little funnel, like a little nozzle that the water would come out and run to their camps. And he stuck a towel in there, shoved it really far in there that, that, um, the kids by themselves couldn't, couldn't pull it out. And they, the kids woke up the next morning, the Eagles don't have water. So they run over to the Rattlers and blame them. And the Rattlers say, no, we don't have water. We thought it was you guys. They both go back and they realize that they both have this common problem. They both don't have water and it's stuck with this towel. So the team kind of worked together, both the Eagles and Rattlers kind of pulled the towel out of there so they can both kind of cooperate and get water for their teams. 
And then the rest of the day, instead of playing like tug of war in kickball, where one group won, the other group lost, they started playing like scavenger hunts and like kind of like escape room type things where they had to work together to collaborate to solve these problems. And what you quickly saw is after, after a couple of days of cooperating and collaborating, they didn't want to be in separate camps anymore. They didn't want to be the Eagles and Rattlers. They want to be all together. They didn't want to have one group eat first and group eat second. They wanted to all, you know, you know, mix up. And by the end of the week, they didn't even want to ride home to their, to their, you know, home again on separate school buses. They all wanted to kind of mix it up. And the Eagles who had won so much money early on stopped at the local store and bought, and, and, and bought balls, these like ice cream shakes for everybody. So it was, it was like a really cool way of showing like how easy it is to create prejudice via competition over limited resource, right? Conflict theory. But then as soon as you start taking away that conflict and start putting in cooperation, prejudice goes away. It's a kind of fun, feel good story about little kids in summer camp. Um, another theory, which uh, does in my opinion an even better job of explaining prejudice is social identity theory. So social identity theory argues that as soon as you categorize yourself as us and them, that's all that you need for prejudice to result. Realistic conflict theory said, hey, there has to be groups and they have to be in conflict with each other over a scarce or limited resource. Social identity theory says, no, you don't even need competition. Social identity theory, as soon as you define us and in-group, and them in out group, as soon as you have two different groups, that's all, that it, that's, all that's required for prejudice to result. So uh, according to social identity theory, people are motivated to maintain the positive distinctiveness of their own group. So w when you ask people at APU, like how good is APU? How kind, moral, generous, good are people at APU? APU people rate themselves really high. That's this kind of in-group favoritism. They say, well, what about people at Biola and Citrus College? And they rate them negative. That's this kind of out-group derogation. As soon as you have an us versus them, the group that you belong to, you think is better than other groups. And the ironic thing is, is if you went to Biola and asked them the same thing, Biola would think that they were better than APU. If you went to Citrus, they would think Citrus is better than APU. Each group thinks that their group is better than others. You can even randomly assign people to groups. You can take a quarter and flip it and say, all right, heads, you're in the heads group. Tails, you're in the tails group. And the heads group thinks that they're more kind, moral, loving, considerate, good, like better people than the tails group. And the tails group think that they're better than the in group. Or the tails group thinks that they're better than the heads group. Which is scary, right? because we are really good at finding ways to divide ourselves. We divide ourselves when it comes to religion, right? Different kind of sects. Oh, are you this denomination versus that denomination, right? And you see some people like holier than thou, self-righteous kind of looking down at other people. You see the same thing on college campus. We're like, oh, like you're not a psych major, right? And you see this, this, this sort of uh, like us versus them. Oh, like nursing majors versus psych majors. And you see people thinking that the group that they belong to is better than others. Social identity theory argues that that's all that you need for prejudice to resolve. is just an us versus them dynamic. Um, at the very first slide on the title page, there was a black and white picture of a, of a third grade class from Riceville, Iowa. And their teacher, Jane Elliott, what she decided to do was uh, create this social identity exper experiment in her class. What she did is she took these third grade uh, kids and um, told them on day one, hey, the blue-eyed kids are better than the brown-eyed kids. She lied, right? She completely made this up, but created this idea of, hey, there's two groups, blue-eyed versus brown-eyed, and just watched it play out from there and watched the blue-eyed kids, you know, think that they were, you know, got to go out to recess first and got to eat first. And what was really cool is you saw the, um, the blue eyed kids start doing better on their learning tasks where the brown eyed kids, when they thought that they were worse on those tasks started doing worse. 
they, 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 they weren't learning their, their words and reading as well. They were experiencing stereotype threat. And you're probably wondering like, how in the world would a teacher like go into a classroom of friends and convince them that half the group is better than the other group? Well, confirmation bias, right? Pulling out selective examples of saying, hey, like, you know, like, um, you did really well on that math test last week, right? Oh, it's because you have blue eyes. And uh, didn't you tell me that you forgot your homework today? Oh, it's because you have brown eyes. Like selectively seeking out information that confirms this idea that one group is better than the other. And you saw just how quickly it played out in a real life instance of social identity theory of prejudice and discrimination. On the second day, she flipped the script and said, you know what? On the first day, I said the blue eyes are better. I was actually wrong. Sorry about that. Brown eyed kids are actually uh, uh, smarter, better, you know, are, are, are better off than blue eyed kids. And she watched the exact same tables kind of turn where on the second day, the brown eyed kids were just as prejudiced and discriminatory as the blue eyed kids. It's a really cool video. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you guys a link to it to watch on PBS. It's free. It's really, really cool. Um, so I would encourage you guys to check it out. It's, it's a different time. Um, so just a warning in advance that some of the children's language is very un PC by like today's standards, but you know, you know, at that period of time in Riceville, Iowa, these little kids never knew what it was going to feel like to be the target of prejudice and discrimination. That's why their teacher Jane Elliott wanted to do this activity so badly. In fact, the reason why she started it in the first place, her kids came up to her and said, Hey, like, you know, I heard on, on, on TV and the news that some King died yesterday. Who was this King? Like, it wasn't some King, it was Martin Luther King Jr. And they realized looking on Riceville, Iowa, which is almost completely white, that the white students in class would never know what it felt like to, you know, to be the target of prejudice and discrimination. So anyway, after this, I will send you guys a link to that video and I encourage you guys to watch it. In fact, a couple exam questions look at like, um, um, uh, ask specifically about like uh, what stereotype threat look like in that classroom and in the confirmation bias, how Jane Elliott got the students to really believe what this looks like. So let me send that video to you guys. And normally if we had time, I would show it in class. So, so far we've been talking a lot about stereotyping, prejudice. The last few slides I wanna talk about discrimination. Um, just to hit this point home that, that discrimination is still alive and well. You see these kind of error bars indicating 95% kind of confidence intervals. So showing that there's kind of variability around people. But when you ask them, what is the rate of perceived discrimination of Americans today? You still see, unfortunately, a lot of sexism, a lot of racism, a lot of ageism, weightism, other appearance, and even other kind of ethnic nationality, self-reported discrimination. And the uh, hate crimes data would mirror the same sort of trend. In fact, in recent years, we're seeing spikes in hate crimes. It's not that people are becoming more racist or sexist or homophobic the um, people that have always been racist, sexist, and homophobic, what's changing more recently is they're believing that it's more socially acceptable to express their prejudice over time. So it's making it seem like in recent years, there's more of a, a, uh, a spike in hate crimes. But if we've learned anything today is that we can change that, right? We, stereotypes are inevitable, but prejudice and discrimination do not have to be. In fact, one of the things that America has done a really good job about, even you know, the, the conversations we've had today, and even the books like White Fragility and all the cool movies on Netflix and things like that, are really highlighting the value of egalitarianism. So like being egalitarian, this motivation to see the self as unprejudiced, like that's to be valued.
And what we can do is use these sort of like egalitarian motives as motivation for people to, uh, to confront their own prejudices. So like, let them take the IAT online and then afterwards say, hey, like did that finding like gel with the way that you view yourself? And for most people, it's not going to be, right? So then putting them in situations of like, okay, how can you change your prejudice? How can you change your behavior towards people? Especially within like kind of institutionalized settings, when you see the downstream effects of discrimination on hiring, when you look at variations in, in resumes that you send in, you can send the exact same resume that's either high quality or low quality and then change the name so it sounds stereotypically white or stereotypically African American. And what you find is even when you send the exact same resume that's low quality, the person with the white name is significantly more likely to get called back for an interview than the person with the black sounding name. And that pattern works for the, for the high quality resumes as well. It can be the exact same stinking resume. If the only thing that changes on it is the white sounding name versus the black sounding name, you still see discrimination in the rate of callbacks. They've shown the exact same pattern of results when it comes to sexism. John and Jane applying for the exact same job with the exact same resume, right? The male sounding name more likely to get called back than the woman. Um, you see the same sort of institutionalized discrimination when you embed clubs and activities on resumes that makes it sound like this person was a member of the, um, uh, what was the, the wording they used? I think like the gay straight alliance on campus or something like that. Include like, I think it was gay straight alliance versus like a fraternity. And what you find is the person that mentioned the fraternity was significantly more likely to be called back. The person that mentioned they were a member of the gay straight alliance was less likely. Like you see discrimination kind of creeping in, even in these hiring practices, which makes it all the more important for folks on the hiring committee to conduct blind reviews, right? To not, to check their own biases at the door and look, not for judgment calls, of does this person seem electable or not, but really start uh, looking at what are the qualifications and does this person have them? Or was this person put in a situation to develop those, those qualifications? And the most important slide of the entire chapter, I would argue the entire semester, is how to reduce prejudice. Integration. Contact, the most contact with as many different people who aren't like you as possible will decrease your prejudice over time. It helps if it's positive and cooperative co you know, contact, but it doesn't have to be. Any sort of interaction is going to be helpful. In fact, you saw Ruby Bridges going to high school integrated. You had the National Guard there trying to protect her, all sorts of people with hateful signs, yelling terrible things. In the short run, there's a lot of conflict, right? But over time, what you realize is, hey, the people that aren't like me, they aren't all the same. In fact, we have a lot more in common. So what you find, the reason why contact theory is effective is it starts knocking down this idea of outgroup homogeneity. So like some people will say things of like, they're all the same. Well, they aren't. You know uh, that your group is really different that people's, you know, have likes and dislikes and some people like are tall and short, like, you know, there's a lot of variability within your own group. And when you start experiencing and interacting with people from other groups than you, you start realizing, hey, they have a lot of variability too, just like us, like just like your own in-group. And what you start finding via this increased contact is we have a lot more in common than we disagree. We both like the same foods. We both love our mamas. We both like you know, the same jokes and watch the same things on TV. Like you start realizing, hey, we have a whole lot more in common. And we know that similarity breeds liking. On a more personal level, when it comes to like talking to your friends and your family members and your future kids, one thing that, that you can do to make your, um, your close network less prejudiced is perspective taking. 
So encouraging them to take other people's perspective, kind of walk a mile in their moccasins. Just putting themselves mentally in someone else's shoes makes them less prejudiced. And here's the link to that video, a class divided that has that kind of Jane Elliott, blue eyes, brown eyes study for you guys to reference. So any, any questions, any other comments about stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination? Cool. All right. I encourage you guys to, to watch this sometime during the week. It's a really, really cool video. I think you'll really love it. If I was there with you in person, I'd show it in class right now. But um, since we're not, let's call it a day. Um, I won't see you next week, right? No class next Thursday. Uh, enjoy your Easter break. I'll see you the week after that. And make sure that you do your exam for sometime before April 16th in two weeks. Sound good? Thank you. No problem. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.